Great. Well, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. My name is Morgan Harper. I'm Director of Policy and Advocacy here at American Economic Liberties Project. And I'm joined this evening by my colleague, Matt Stoller, who's off camera at the moment, but we on shortly, uh, our Director of Research. And welcome to Thinking Big. This is a, a new uh, series for us. It's a virtual book talk series, and we're excited to get it going. And you know, the reason why we've decided to launch this is I think we can all agree we are living in very strange, difficult, confusing times. We're going through a lot of economic, uh, social uncertainty, and we at Economic Liberties wanted to create a forum for us to hear from those who are doing a lot of thinking and research on what's going on and really driving our politics right now, people who have written books about it, um, and bring them into the conversation, and also all of you. And so that's the point of this series. And tonight, we're going to be kicking things off with Peter Goodman, which we're really excited about, uh, author of Davos Man, How the Billionaires Devoured the World. And before getting to Peter, just a quick programming note. So we already have a couple more of the events in this series scheduled. On July 21st, we will be hearing from University of Michigan Associate Professor Elizabeth Pop Berman about her book, Thinking Like an Economist, How Efficiency Replaced Equality in US Public Policy. And on August 16th, we'll feature Brandy Collins Dexter, who's one of our board members and also a visiting fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School about her book, Black Skinhead Reflections on Blackness in Our Political Future. So if you haven't already registered for those, or if you don't get our mails, our mailing list, please register and we'll look forward to seeing you then. But like I said, tonight's main event is Peter Goodman, and we're very honored to have him with us to kick off this series. Um, for those who are, don't already know Peter, he is a global economics correspondent for the New York Times. And before joining the Times, he was at the Washington Post for over a decade, and also has served as the executive business and global news editor at the Huffington Post. In addition to Davos Mann, our focus of this evening, he's the author of Past Due, The End of Easy Money, and The Renewal of the American Economy. Davos Man, which we're gonna be discussing today, uh, was described by NPR as a powerful, fiery book and could well be an essential one. It explains the policy mechanisms, and this is really important, decisions by governments that have given rise to extreme wealth inequality, including how the ultra rich gamed the COVID-19 pandemic to supercharge their own wealth and power. And what I, one of the things I really loved about the book is that Peter tells a lot of stories, and I, I think we'll hear from him, some of the stories of people who have been left behind as a result of these policy decisions all over the world that really exemplify just the, the risks of allowing these types of decisions to continue. So please join me this evening in welcoming Peter, and I'll turn it over to him to provide some opening remarks. Peter? Yeah. Uh, oh, whoops. I'm sorry. Thank you so much, Morgan. Uh, and thank you for having me. I got to say, it's it's an, a special pleasure to be uh, the inaugural for your series at, at the American Economic Liberties Project. I'm a, a serious reader uh, of your reports of, of Matt Stoller's uh, newsletter, which is really essential reading. Uh, and I drew heavily on Matt's book, Goliath, uh, in my treatment of uh, monopoly power and, and antitrust in my book. So, and thanks to all of you for joining. You know, a couple of months ago, I was uh, traveling with my family on vacation and we came home through LaGuardia Airport. LaGuardia, you know, most New Yorkers think of as a synonym for a horrible infrastructure, embarrassing, decrepit infrastructure. And suddenly we were overwhelmed by the beauty of this new terminal. And we wondered, what did this fantastic thing cost to build? And we looked it up and we discovered it was about five and a half billion dollars. And I thought, man, for that money, we could have sent Jeff Bezos into space for 11 minutes. Um, that's obviously a joke, uh, but not entirely because uh, most of us uh, have lived through uh, for the entirety of our adult lives, uh, a period where our economic systems are, are governed by the notion that if we figure out how to return more wealth to the people who already have most of it, uh, somehow, everyone wins. This is a notion that I refer to as the cosmic lie uh, in my book. Uh, it, it encompasses uh, not only trickle-down economics, but the idea that you know the bigger the company, the more efficient and the better that is for society. And we best not uh, get uh, in front uh, of uh, the operations of the of this supposed free market, this mythical uh, 
notion, uh, mostly the work of lobbyists, uh, that we should just allow businesses to uh, operate according to their own devices, unless, of course, they need a bailout or some other market intervention from the government to help them along their way. And, and we are told, I mean, none of this has happened by accident. That's really the central mission of, of my book is to reveal uh, that are our, our being marinated in that cosmic lie. Uh, none of this has happened by accident. It's happened thanks to uh, decades of effective lobbying, uh, work by tax accountants, uh, and work by public relations uh, masters, and of course, uh, credulous uh, people in my own profession who would prefer to do access journalism and experience the thrill of incremental scoops or you know access with powerful people as opposed to actually holding those powerful people to account. And as a result of that, uh, we've got uh, the consequences that we can see uh, all around us, uh, things like the downgrading of work, which have left you know huge numbers of people in our own country uh, unable to rely on on the old proposition that if you just you know set your alarm clock and get off and uh, get up and go off to work and work hard and stay out of trouble, you can count on a middle class standard of living, something that is just simply not operative any longer. Uh, we see it. Uh, in the numbers of people around us who are worried about health care, who understand that if a relative gets really seriously ill, uh, there may, may be no care for them. We see it in the masses of homeless people in just about every uh, major American city. And of course, we see it in the toxic nature of our discourse. I mean, not just the conspiracy theories on social media, the, the, the sense of accusation and division in our politics, but really the breakdown in faith about el elites institutions, and even facts. I mean, we are now living in a time when huge numbers of people have concluded quite legitimately that their needs, their ability uh, to support their families just don't matter very much to the powers that be. And the consequences of that are a breakdown uh, in, in what we can simply call democracy. We don't trust one another. Large numbers of people legitimately don't trust the system and the consequences are poisonous. This is more than a source of resentment, anger, and cynicism. I mean, what I'm arguing in my book is that widening inequality, and not just in the US, but around the globe, because my book was uh, reported while I was living in London, uh, working as a global economic correspondent and, and initially the European economic correspondent for the New York Times. This is really a global phenomenon, though the US uh, sees this uh, especially strongly. Economic inequality is the single most potent threat to democracy. Uh, and, and that, in a nutshell, is the story that, that I'm, I'm here to tell you and that I tell in the book, that you know, we took an economic system that was not uh, perfect, was not without flaws, but by and large was working from the end of the Second World War till about the late 1970s. You know, the old cliche, a rising tide lifts all boats. That was really happening. Uh, and we took that system and we allowed the billionaire class to essentially use their wealth to purchase uh, control of our democracy and to rewrite the laws, uh, be they antitrust, uh, tax, labor in their own interest. And, and that is how uh, we enabled a massive, systematic, bottom-up transfer of wealth that has had uh, decisive impacts in our societies. This is a story that I saw up close in London, where uh, Brexit, you know, which is commonly uh, viewed as a reaction to immigration, was, uh, if you're looking at it properly, really a reaction to the basic breakdown of the economic bargain uh, and, and, and breakdown in the faith of the elites. Post-2008 financial crisis, bankers get bailed out. Uh, there are corporate tax cuts served up you know, in the service of the cosmic lie, this idea that if we, you know, if we cut taxes on companies, then we'll get all this investment, we'll get all this hiring. We don't get uh, much of, of, of any of that. Instead, what we get is a decade of punishing austerity where uh, basic programs from the National Health Service to education to programs uh, for disabled people, uh, people in need of help with housing are slashed quite dramatically. Ordinary people pay the freight uh, for these tax cuts and bailouts uh, for the wealthy class. 
And 10 years later, that allows, uh, ironically, uh, a very cynical group of uh, billionaires to uh, underwrite a campaign that produces Brexit. These billionaires, I detail this in the story, really just want out from under uh, European financial regulations imposed after the 2008 financial crisis. And uh, they persuade everybody else that this is all about slamming the gates on immigrants and taking back control and all of these uh, sorts of slogans. This is a similar story uh, that we've seen uh, in France uh, still playing out where the yellow vests, the gilets jaunes are a more complex uh, movement uh, in that it's a mix of the extreme right and also some of the left. Uh, but there is certainly within it a nativist response to the idea that benefits are being uh, paid out uh, to immigrants, uh, and, and the result is a demonizing of immigrants uh, that, uh, on the surface, that's really just masking a reaction to Macron's uh, cutting of wealth taxes at the same time that he's increasing taxes on ordinary people through gasoline taxes. And this, of course, is in large part the story of Donald Trump, uh, who takes office uh, talking about very real problems in terms of the breakdown of the middle class bargain. Uh, but instead of blaming the people who actually delivered it, the people in Washington who are writing the rules, who are accepting uh, massive campaign contributions uh, from uh, special interests, uh, decisions that are made in boardrooms in Seattle and New York, you know, he blames it on immigrants and says, we're going to build a wall. Uh, he blames it on China. China, of course, is a very complex a problem in the global trading system. Uh, China does present an issue that requires, you know, some confrontation, but, but Trump uses China as a way to essentially diagnose uh, the problems of uh, the declining American middle class while then uh, delivering policies that just further enrich uh, the billionaire class. And we, we've seen similar stories in Brazil, in India, in the Philippines, the, the point is that when people with the sense of birthright privilege, whether they're French people or Americans or even Swedes, you know, I tell the story in my book of Sweden, the supposed bastion of social democracy, uh, where uh, there's a big influx of, of immigrants in 2015. And the result is that the Sweden Democrats, this party with roots in the neo-Nazi movement, uh, goes from the wilderness to the third most popular party in the country. You know, each of these cases reveals that on the surface, we get a reaction to something, usually immigration, uh, that rests upon the long term uh, breakdown of the basic economic bargain for regular people. Uh, this is a monumental grift. Let me just throw a couple of statistics at you to bring this home. You know, over the last four decades, the wealthiest 1% of Americans has gained a collective $21 trillion in wealth. This, by the way, these are pre-pandemic numbers from my book. Over the same period, households in the bottom half have seen their fortunes diminish by $900 billion. Since 1978, corporate executives have seen their total compensation explode by more than 900%, while wages for the typical American worker have risen by less than 12%. And here, I think, is the key statistic, and the last one I'll throw at you, uh, you know, in light of the fact that I know many of you are properly concerned about uh, monopoly power, which certainly uh, is, is a major part of the explanation for this systematic bottom-up transfer of wealth. Had we continued to distribute income in the United States in the same fashion as we did during the first three decades after World War II, the bottom 90% of earners, this according to a RAND study, would have received an additional $47 trillion dollars. And instead, that money flowed upwards to the executive class, to shareholders, to the billionaire class. And, and I just want to reinforce, none of this happened by accident. Uh, I pin the blame on a tribe uh, that I call Davos Man. This is a term that I've stolen from the political scientist Samuel Huntington, who coined it back in 2004, to describe people who go to the World Economic Forum, this annual gathering of the glittering class, you know, billionaires, heads of state, the odd celebrity, a few public intellectuals and a couple of artists thrown in uh, to make it appear that it's not just about money. Uh, they meet, you know, on the mountaintop in Davos, usually in January. I, I use the term slightly uh, more uh, narrowly than Huntington. I'm interested in the part of the billionaire class that would have us uh, buy the idea that they are not only the 
not the problem, forgive the double or even triple negative, uh, they are the solution that, that in fact, uh, we can uh, outsource our problems to well-connected, uh, concerned, thoughtful billionaires. And I argue in the book that, you know, Davos, which, you know, I, I, I mean, there, there's a certain amount of sort of Davos porn that we can uh, revel in, uh, maybe a charade that we can all see through. I mean, I, I've, I've seen in Davos, you know, billionaires uh, engage in simulations of the Syrian refugee experience. I'm not making this up. They, they submit to being blindfolded and led around in the dark and somebody's hollering at them in Arabic, demanding papers that they don't have. Uh, and then they congratulate one another for their display of empathy. And then they go off to some banquet sponsored by some global bank or consulting company where they drink champagne and eat truffles and, and, and get on with their real business, which is schmo schmoozing and doing deals. We can all see through that uh, and see that that's a charade. But this idea that the billionaires uh, are our saviors has really permeated our culture. And, and Davos itself, you know, is an important sort of rallying point for the billionaire class. I, I tell the story of Mark Benioff, the CEO of Salesforce, the Silicon Valley tech company is one of the five main characters in, in, in my book. Uh, and he literally said in January of 2021, that Davos that, that year was virtual because of the pandemic, he said, the CEOs are the real heroes of the pandemic. I mean, not frontline medical workers, not parents dealing with children, contending with distance learning, not people emptying bedpans and nursing homes. No, the CEOs are the heroes of the pandemic. And, and his examples were, you know, they gave us vaccines and they kept credit taps flowing. So they staved off bankruptcies. And he told the story of how he personally uh, pulled strings with his connections in China uh, to find 50 million pieces of PPE during the first wave of the pandemic. We're talking, you know, ma face masks and hand sanitizer and, and medical gowns. And he brought them to frontline medical workers. And I am, you know, willing to believe that that actually did save people's lives. I mean, if we didn't have gear for frontline medical workers uh, in, uh, the, in the worst pandemic in a century, I, I think it's a good thing that somebody went off and got some. But it's also worth asking, why are we dependent upon a tech bro to outfit us uh, with medical gear in the worst pandemic in a century? Uh, what is it that has failed in our society? Well, it's not an accident that Mark Benioff uh, is uh, the head of a company that has managed not once but twice to pay the modest sum of zero in federal taxes uh, in recent years. And, you know, the, the government... Uh, is, is weakened, of course, and can't maintain basic infrastructure, can't maintain uh, an effective uh, public health apparatus, uh, to say uh, nothing of, you know, the workforce that is able to be trained to go work at places like uh, Salesforce to help people like Mark Benioff become incredibly uh, wealthy. And it, lest you think I'm making too much of this little anecdote, I mean, Benioff himself underscored it. I mean, he, he actually said, the government didn't save you, non-governmental organizations didn't save you, we saved you, and not for profit, but to save the world. Well, uh, I've talked for enough, and I'd like to hear your questions, but I, I, I will say, you know, some people have written that off as a kind of gaffe. I think it's, it's highly revealing of the Davos man mindset that we will handle all of your problems, and really this is it's not just Davos, it's other gatherings of, of billionaires and other examples of virtue signaling and things like stakeholder capitalism that we can talk about at length if, if, if you like. This is a, a kind of prophylactic against us, the people, using our democracy to pursue democratic ends. This is the billionaire class saying, you don't have to regulate us, you don't have to, have to enforce antitrust, uh, you don't have to uh, impose progressive taxation or uh, rules that allow labor to organize so it can get a fair piece of the action. You just have to let us do what we do. And out of that uh, will come solutions to huge problems like climate change and shortages of gear during the pandemic and, and the problem of, of low wages. Just count on us. Well, we've lived through an open air experiment in this cosmic lie for almost half a century and the results are in and, and, and they're not good. Uh, and we can get into solutions if you like, but 
but they're they're not uh, exotic and they're not utopian. They're about doing uh, what we've already done. Uh, this to get back to Matt Stoller's book is a story that he tells very very well and in detail uh, about our our success as a democracy and taking on the robber barons and producing precisely the economic order that did uh, lift all boats, pardon the cliche. And we can do that again, but it will require uh, real mobilization instead of outsourcing our problems to Davos men. So why don't I leave it there? Uh, and I'd, I'd love to hear your questions. Th thanks for listening. All right. Thank you for this, um, that great talk. Um, so for everyone listening, it's a really good book. It's got all these delightful nuggets, um, like phrases. There's this great phrase where he, he says, Mark Benioff was having an amazing pandemic. Hmm. And there's all these like these little breadcrumbs that are that are terrific. Um, so uh, I'm going to ask a couple of questions. Morgan has a, a, some questions, but this is really about you guys. Um, and so please feel free and in fact, we encourage you to put questions in the chat and we will uh, bring them up and ask Peter. Um, this is our first event. It's our, it's our first um, thinking big event on, uh, with, a, with an author. So this is kind of an experiment, but, uh, but please put your questions in the queue and, um, and we'll have a, a conversation. But I wanted to, um, I wanted to start with, um, with, with actually Davos itself. Sure. Um, and one of the things I really liked about how you how you wrote the book is is it, it you know it's these big highfalutin concepts, but you also you know you're a reporter, so you give a, a nice flavor. And you know the way you wrote about it, like this, it's it sounds like it kind of sucks as an experience. Like it's not fun. <laughs> it's like it's cramped. Like there's the, yeah. you can't really get food. Like it's um, it's also started by this weird guy Klaus Schwab. Yeah, uh, and I also like that that a lot of characters in the book were like um, were on the board of the World Economic Forum. But who is Klaus Schwab? Like, how did this guy create like the carnival of Davos? Of well, the carnival of billionaires. Yeah, well, thanks for asking that. So Klaus Schwab is a German economist who came of age in the post-war era, and he's steeped in appreciation for European integration as a project. Uh, and also American management speak. Uh, he visited the states in the 60s and he picked up, you know, reverence for total quality management, you know, whatever, whatever the word of the time is. And I think he actually coined this concept of stakeholder capitalism, you know, that it's not just Milton Friedman and greed and profit maximization for shareholders. It's it's about catering to, to stakeholders. And, uh, you know, there's there's the word of our time. Uh, he's written a couple of books about stakeholder capitalism. So he, back in the, in the early 70s, decides that public-private partnership is the key to solving all problems. You got to get the, the private sector together with government uh, and how best to do this. Well, let's all gather high up in the Alps uh, and uh, we'll have this seminar, we'll have government, we'll have, we'll have business, and they'll meet and talk about the problems of the day. Well, that may have begun uh, as just a well-intentioned, you know, get the ball rolling. Somewhere along the line, Klaus Schwab, as he began mixing with wealthier and wealthier and more and more powerful people, uh, I'm going to psychoanalyze, decided hey, these people aren't smarter or better than I am. Uh, he spent a lot of time with Bezos in the late 90s. I'd like some of that money. Uh, and so the World Economic Forum is on paper a nonprofit, but it's become a gusher of money for uh, Klaus Schwab and, and his wife, Hilda Schwab, who is the founder. And I, I tell the story of how uh, in the late 90s, uh, he, send, he dispatches his nephew, Hans, uh, off to Boston to run this, uh, you know, like way early version of Zoom. This is video uh, conferencing. And uh, Hans Schwab eventually uh, manages to partner with like Microsoft and other tech companies. And then he, he, he engineers a sale of this company to a listed company called US WebCore. And it turns out that Klaus Schwab, despite the World Economic Forum being a nonprofit, took $5 million as seed capital from the forum itself, put it into this video thing, sold it, 
And at the last minute, Hans Schwab told me on the record, his uncle Klaus called and said, hey, uh, the proceeds of the sale, which at that point are upwards of $20 million, they're not going to go to the forum. They're going to go to this new thing, the Klaus and Hilda Schwab uh, Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship, which under Swiss law, like we'll never know anything about. They put out reports. They tell you that, you know, they're spending money to drill wells in sub-Saharan Africa and they're promoting uh, access to schools for girls in Pakistan and Bangladesh, but there's no money trail. And then along the way, we've seen that the forum has, and this I confirmed with some independent research, you know, with a colleague in Switzerland, the forum has spent its own money to buy parcels of land worth tens of millions of dollars, making contiguous Schwab's mansion on the shores of Lake Geneva and the forum's headquarters uh, itself, which is this like really magnificent uh, glass building. And the stories about Klaus Schwab are legion. You know, he, he, uh, he once tried to fire an employee for parking in his designated parking spot when she thought that he was uh, out of town. Uh, he, he throws a fit uh, if he shows up in a country and he's not accorded the privileges of a head of state. I mean, his staff is like terrified of his various tantrums. And we just don't know where the money goes. But we know that um, he, that his private events business, another business he he launched uh, using the form of seed capital, uh, runs the hotel concession in Davos, where, you know, suddenly, like the first time I was in Davos, I paid, I think, 400 US dollars for, you know, a dormitory bed with a shared bathroom, you know, in like a mile from the Congress Center. I mean, there, there's limited hotel rooms, and they've used that scarcity to just gin up the prices. And we don't know where the money goes, but we know that Schwab's events business gets a piece of the action. He and his wife get Audis. I mean, Audi is the, uh, is the official member. Uh, I'm sorry, the official uh, car provider for the forum. And so they get, you know, cut rate uh, cars. He gets flown around first class on Swiss Air, which is another, you know, strategic partner. And he loves to play matchmaker. I mean, his genius really was to understand that the, the world's full of, you know, conferences full of business people trying to make more money. I mean, Forbes and Fortune, they handle that just fine. But he turned the forum into this opportunity for virtue signaling. I mean, the, the mantra is, committed to improving the state of the world. I mean, you see that on banners hanging from every street light, every meeting room in the Congress Center in Davos is, is full of that. And you know what an incredible statement, given that the people gathering there are by any reasonable measure, the ultimate beneficiaries of the status quo. But he's managed to sell this idea that your participation there demonstrates your concern about climate change and racial justice and gender Im imbalance. But what he's really doing is he's vacuuming up these sponsorships and these strategic partnerships that are worth hundreds of thousands of dollars a year from giant tech companies, from the biggest finance companies. And then he plays matchmaker. If you pay for the ultimate memberships, then you get access to these private lounges where there are no annoying people like journalists, there are no regulators present, and he will take, you know, a member of uh, the Saudi monarchy and sit them across the table from, you know, a French uh, energy giant and let them do what they do in private. That, yeah, that, I mean, that's, that's a great recounting of it. And, you know, I, it, as I was reading the book, and this is like a, kind of an experience that I think a lot of us have had over the last five, 10 years, especially when you learn about Davos and um, where, you know, there's, there's like all these billionaires and heads of state and, um, and various like authoritarian regime types who get together in like the Swiss, Al Swiss Alps once a year and sort of scheme and plan. And it kind of, does it give you like more sympathy for conspiracy theorists? Um, you know, that's an interesting question. I mean, I, yeah, I get how if you're not there, then it looks like, boy, all these people have all this power of meeting. That must be where they're writing uh, the rules for the world. I actually am fairly dismissive of the conspiracy theories because I don't think, I mean, if you look at what the forum puts out, um, it's for all sorts of things that I think, you know, your audience would probably be for, you know, more, more transparency in corporate governance, greater power for activists, shareholders, uh, serious, you know, carbon trading, attempts to deal with climate change, more power for labor. I mean, it, it's actually, 
it's for these things. It, it studies the threat of automation in terms of jobs, but it doesn't actually have any power. And I don't think it really wants any power. It wants to be, I mean, the conspiracy theory is, I, I argue, actually strengthen the value proposition of Davos for the people attending, because it makes it seem like, yes, we are actually earnestly worrying about the state of the world, when in reality, Davos man is not loyal to any ideology or any nation. Davos man is loyal to the bottom line. And if it's a good, if Davos man has monopoly power and benefits from crushing competitors, then Davos man is for the free market and there shouldn't be any intervention from labor unions or, you know, the Federal Trade Commission or, you know, anything. And yet if Davos man needs something like a bailout or a rescue, well, then Davos man is for you know, the state doing right by society, we need this. To, I, I just, I don't see where the uh, meetings at Davos, these sort of earnest seminars that nobody, that the cool kids don't even go to. I mean, the most powerful people at Davos will boast about how they never set foot in the Congress Center. They just sat in their private suites, you know, doing deals for four days, basically saving themselves, having to fly around the world to meet one another. They're all in the same place. So, you know, there are always big deals that come out of there. I, I just think the whole thing's really a charade. It's not, it's not like some sort of secret government. And in fact, you know, I could have written about other places uh, besides Davos. I, I, I treat the book as like I'm taking you on a guided safari of this separate species from the rest of humanity. And where do we go on safari to see the big game? Well, we go to the watering hole. Davos Man's just a watering hole. It's where these people all, you know, they hang out and dine and schmooze. So, so uh, just to for people who just joined up, we're, we're with Peter Goodman. This We're talking about his book, Davos Man, How the Billionaires Devour the World. And you can buy it um, through any number of, of oligarch, uh, oligarchic booksellers. <laughs> you can buy it from your independent bookseller. No, I have independent booksellers. Um, so uh, why don't we take, uh, why don't we take a question um, from the, from the rabble? Um, <laughs> Yay, which is Rabble. off brand for yeah. Davos. So, um, so Martha Ross um, is asking, uh, what do you think it would take to get companies to change from the business model reliant on paying low wages and accepting high turnover? Um, and uh, she brings up the fact that there was a leaked Amazon memo. Amazon's a big firm in the in the book um, that says that uh, that Amazon's actually run out of uh, workers to employ. Um, and so, yeah. So, what would it take? Sure. To change the, the the business model of a firm like Amazon. Well, now, first of all, we're bleeding into my next book, which is going to be called How the World Ran Out of Everything, which will also draw on a lot of the stuff that the American Economic Liberties Project is talking about uh, in terms of monopoly power behind a lot of the shortages and so-called greedflation. Um, you know, look, first of all, I'm I'm not at all sympathetic to this idea that we have all these worker shortages. Most of the ones I've looked at, I mean, I've looked in detail at over the road truck drivers, and I'm sure with warehouse workers, it's the same. It's not that we've run out of human beings who can do the jobs that we need people to do to get the stuff that we have become dependent on. It's that we've run out of human beings who are willing to accept the proposition that they should have, you know, no health care, no time with their families, no ability to schedule their lives. Uh, and and be susceptible to you know summary termination with no days off or giving birth to a child or taking care of a sick relative. We've run out of people willing to do that, and we're in a you know a brief moment where because of uh, the 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 extraordinary uh, supply chain problems uh, brought uh, by the pandemic, there actually are some shortages that have increased at least in the immediate, immediate term, the power of labor. But, you know, what would it take uh, to uh, build an economy that's just not, I'm, I'm, I'm now uh, maybe rephrasing the question, you know, built on systematic exploitation of labor? I mean, that's pretty simple. We need unions to be able to bargain collectively uh, for their wages. Uh, and, and we need uh, enforcement of antitrust laws uh, so that, you know, we're not in a situation where producers, I mean, I, I'm going to tell the story of uh, cattle ranchers, producers like cattle ranchers have, you know, very few choices in terms of where to sell their animals because the, the packers have managed to uh, grow so powerful and concentrated. I mean, we need the government to do 
its job. And it's a job that the public actually wants them to do uh, so that we actually do have something like a free marketplace. I mean, there's no such thing as a free market short of, 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 of regulators and somebody to make sure that we don't just have uh, monopoly power. And that, that's central to having real competition. And if we have real competition, plus uh, the power of labor to organize for its own piece of the action, that should tend to produce higher wages and, and better working conditions. Yeah, that no, that's interesting because because it's both the dealing with the top as antitrust and then at the bottom and making sure there's labor organizing and having both of those. That was that was that was very much key in the earlier part of the century. Um, so so we have an anonymous attendee who has a question, uh, which is if the Davos man thinks of himself as this unsung hero, can you talk a little bit about how they view people challenging their authority, especially underdogs like Chris Smalls, who is in your book? Um, although right. not not his most recent, um, yeah, not not where everything is now, but he's in your book. So yeah, no, I tell the story of Chris Smalls at some length. Uh, the book ends before his successful organizing of a union. Uh, who is, sorry, who is Chris Smalls? Just for oh sure. So Chris Smalls is a guy who was working as a supervisor at a major Amazon warehouse in Staten Island, New York who looked around in March of 2020 and said, I don't get it. Uh, why is it that all the managers are suddenly gone? Uh, now, Chris Malls is an African-American guy who was uh, born and raised uh, in Newark, New Jersey. And at that point in his career, he had worked a series of warehouse jobs, uh, almost always for white managers with most of the employees uh, African-American. And he was accustomed to, you know, as he put it to me, to uh, working while managers are riding around on forklifts, screaming at him to work faster, he and his colleagues, almost like he said to me, you know, picking cotton in the fields. Uh, and uh, so here he is in the spring of 2020. And the people of color who dominate the warehouse ranks are still doing their thing. They don't have any uh, PPE. They don't have face masks, hand sanitizer, gloves. Bezos puts out this letter after Chris Smalls and others start asking questions about the pandemic and uh, how come they don't have any PPE. And Bezos puts out a letter that says, Dear Amazonians, uh, and he thanks them for their sacrifice. You know, you are, you're not just engaged in this profitable enterprise, you're actually saving other people's grandmothers. We're prioritizing the uh, gear that people need, like hand sanitizer and masks. But somehow we don't have enough of it for you. Uh, and Smalls tells me, you know, this is just total nonsense. They can see what's going in the boxes. He says, it's the same stuff that they're always putting into boxes. It's, it's jars of peanut butter. It's, you know, video game consoles. It's exercise equipment. It's, uh, you know, exercise clothing. It's, it's sex toys. He said, we, we could just see that this was total nonsense. So Smalls eventually organizes a walkout. He's fired for violating quarantine, which is really bitterly ironic, given that he wants everyone to be quarantined, but with pay. Uh, and the US is not by accident, the only major developed economy that does not have a federal paid sick leave policy. So Chris Malls and his colleagues have to choose between their paychecks and their health. So he's fired. Uh, and then thanks to uh, Vice News, we learn that there's a meeting run by uh, this guy Zapolsky, Amazon's general counsel, with Bezos in attendance. And Zapolsky says, uh, you know, we, we should train our lens on Christian Smalls and make him the public face of this labor movement because he is not smart or articulate. And to the extent to which he is the face of this, we will benefit no one objects to this, according to these notes. Uh, so Bezos has no problem with this. Uh, and when I call Amazon later and ask them, you know, how does Zapol and, and by the way, I looked at Zapolsky's Facebook page. Zapolsky's a guy born not that far from Newark, New Jersey, but in a in a posh uh, community, suburban community. He goes to an Ivy League school, has a tribute to John Lewis, the late civil rights hero, on his <laughs> Facebook page. And when I, when I call Amazon, I say, you know, how do we square what you all are saying about your adherence to stakeholder capitalism and 
and uh, your reverence for John Lewis with what you're saying about Chris Mullins. They said, well, Mr. Sapolsky re regrets his comments, and he was not aware of Mr. Small's race at the time that he made them. Now, Smalls had been all over national television at that point, uh, so parse that as you will. But now I've lost track of the original question. No, I think you covered it, which is, which is um, how do they view people? How do these unsung heroes, the Davos men, see people? Oh, yeah, they people? view them as impediments to their efficiency. Uh, and, you know, when you start with the with the proposition that you're the good guys, I mean, if if like Benioff and Benioff's not alone, you view yourself as a hero, then the more money you've got, the more power you've got, the more good you can do. Um, and that's why they view philanthropy as, you know, way better than taxation, because they're much more efficient than the government. They're much more generous and smart and they have technological solutions. And, you know, this is a tradition that goes all the way back to Henry Ford, I've learned. I mean, the idea that you view labor unions as antithetical to the interests of the consumer. Uh, and, you know, Matt, your book is terrific, you know, telling the story of Robert Bork and how, you know, this reverence for the, the consumer, this mythical creature who, who, you know, only shops, you know, doesn't actually, you know, require services or taxes, you know, isn't a worker, is just a consumer. And as long as whatever action a company takes doesn't jack up wages, it uh, doesn't, I'm sorry, jack up prices, in the immediate term for the consumer, then we should just embrace it. Uh, well, the labor union, the labor movement is antithetical to serving the interests of the consumer in the construction of Davos Man. And that's, that's been a very you know, powerful force that's really dominated our lives for decades. And no, just one question, uh, Peter. And what's the sure. reaction been kind of building off of that? Because for the non Davos men of us, which is obviously most of this planet, you know, you read this and you, I, I found myself, you kind of just want to throw up. I mean, it's very disgusting behavior, predatory behavior. I love the use of the defined terms because it really just makes you get into this mindset of these are foreign predatory creatures. Uh, what's the reaction been from the men themselves, other people to the book? Total silence from, from the men themselves. Uh, and, you know, that's not surprising to me. I mean, in, in the run up uh, to publication, uh, there were, you know, letters from lawyers uh, with the implicit threat of action. Yeah, you know, look, I, I take getting the facts uh, right, you know, very seriously. And I, I, I put defense in that. Uh, I, I think it's clear that you know, these billionaires, well, first of all, you know, Bezos is so accustomed to criticism. It's like, it's nothing new to have another book come along and criticize him. I think Benioff was taken aback uh, and is not used to this kind of scrutiny. And he did engage me in the reporting, but then went silent uh, when I ran an excerpt uh, that uh, uses his story prominently. Uh, Larry Fink, uh, you know, through his company, uh, pushed back while I was reporting, but has been totally silent since. Steve Schwartzman, the founder of Blackstone, the world's largest private equity company. Uh, there was a lot of pre-publication uh, jockeying, uh, demanding of certain perspectives that caused me to, you know, look at my facts, you know, even more carefully than I usually would. But nothing, nothing since. And Jamie Dimon, who's my my fifth character. Um, also, also silence. I mean, the only reaction I got actually was from the forum itself, where uh, the um, the head communications guy, who's a very nice guy, Peter Van Ham, uh, wrote this public blog post basically saying, yes, you know, we really applaud your description of economic inequality as a source for right wing populism. And it's such a big problem. But we really wish you had left the forum out of it. We think we think your treatment of the forum itself is really, really misguided. Uh, and then Klaus Schwab refused to sit for an interview on his book, Stakeholder Capitalism, unless I could guarantee him prominent placement in the New York Times, which was something I could not do. You know, we're going to have to talk. Klaus wants me to talk to you about that. Uh, <laughs> very disappointed. Um, uh, in fact, he wanted a prominent place on, on this Zoom. Yeah, I'll bet. And, and we, we couldn't guarantee that to him, so he was disappointed in us as well. It's... It's disappointing all around. Um, so, okay, so we have a just a question from Todd Mensch, who, um, uh, so he has, he, he's asking, what is a significant or impactful area for reform 
Um, like, could you have a, a is a maximum tax rate for person or corporations important or considering how dramatically capital allocation has changed over the past 50 years, like real estate finance over production, right. are there more important reforms? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think you'll be surprised by my answer to this one. I mean, wealth taxes are absolutely critical. Um, I think as many people know, but if you don't, it, it, it bears repeating. You know, just take Bezos. Bezos's last salary, as reported at Amazon, is about $83,000 a year. So Jeff Bezos earns approximately what an elementary school teacher in California earns in a year. So if we just tax income, uh, first of all, these Davos men are masters at minimizing their income every conceivable way. Uh, private equity in particular through, you know, partnership allocations, uh, capital gains taxes are lower than what most of us pay uh, on our income taxes. I mean, it's just an incredibly unfair system. I mean, most of us, uh, we work a job, our employer withholds uh, our taxes according to a pretty clear formula. If we uh, own a home, then we actually do pay a form of wealth taxes in terms of property taxes that are incredibly regressive compared to, to the billionaires. And meanwhile, the billionaires are making their money on, uh, mostly it's on stock. Uh, and unless they sell their stock, they don't pay any tax at all. Uh, and it turns out, thanks to ProPublica, we now know, they don't even sell their stock. They have like this permanent credit card where they just run up a balance that they'll never pay back, or maybe they'll pay it back when they die. And they can fund, you know, literally billions of dollars worth of purchases without even having to sell the stock that's given them all this money that's allowing somebody to lend them the money in perpetuity to spend. That's just, that, that's just an incredibly unfair system. Now, we cannot finance the things that people actually want, like national health care, uh, like affordable education, uh, like help for people who lose their jobs and require training. We, we can't do any, we can't take care of our infrastructure. We can't do any of these things without more revenue. But then just from a, a, a basic fairness standpoint, you know, how do we say to a coal miner in West Virginia, Sorry, pal, you know, your way of supporting your family is no longer needed. Uh, go find something else to do when that coal miner can see that we have this incredibly unfair system where the people at the top aren't even paying, you know, what the people who are scrubbing their toilets are paying as a share of their income in taxes. And that just contributes to this deep cynicism that makes it impossible for us to solve you know, very real problems like the pandemic, like climate change, like the future of work. I mean, we just can't have a normal conversation about any kind of solution. So I think wealth taxes are, are central to that. Um, I also think that, I mean, in terms of the work that you all are doing, I mean, it's, it's absolutely critical that we get back to serious antitrust enforcement when we look at competition policy in, in, in an aggressive way, uh, because um, we don't have, you know, some people have reacted to my book to say, oh, you know, you're against capitalism. You're, hey, I love capitalism. I mean, we don't have capitalism. We have this kind of permanent corporate welfare for people who can afford to hire lobbyists by the dozen. And then we have rugged individualism for every other sucker who, you know, is, is, is left on their own. We need capitalism, but that's going to require uh, a real marketplace where there's real competition and where people aren't just at the mercy of some giant company like Amazon that, you know, steals ideas from its, 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 its supposed uh, customers and clients and, uh, and, and, and can, can manipulate the, the, the labor market, can manipulate, you know, all sorts of markets for transportation, can afford to hire at a time of supply chain chaos, you know, its own planes and, and, and uh, container vessels, while every, every small business is stuck dealing with the cartel that is uh, international shipping. So those are the things I think we need. We need wealth taxes, we need antitrust enforcement, and we've already talked about labor. We need rules that allow labor unions to organize and mobilize. So, um, so last, last question, um, so I'm going to try to co combine a couple of them. Um, sure. So I would say, I would say, first of all, we also need, I think good journalism is really important. Sure. Just exposing of, I mean, fundamentally this book is premised and our work is premised on the idea that the truth has value, like sure. truth broadly dis distributed. So 
you know, a lot of the work that you've done, not just in this book, but in your reporting as well, I think is really important for people to know the source of their frustration, the, the details. Right. But, you know, one thing that struck me about the book, and I think this was deliberate, is that it's a global story. Right. It's not just about it, the, the main, a lot of, most of the characters are American, although not all of them. There's, there's Macron, there's a, a several others. But, you know, you were, you were, you know, Sweden to France um, to uh, Argentina. It's kind of the same trends. And, you know, what I was particularly interested in is, is the health system response to COVID, right? And you were like looking at how there were actually commonalities and privatization and problems in the systems in Europe that we saw in the U.S. as well that we don't, in, from the U.S. perspective, we don't typically, we were, we're thinking, oh, look, the Europeans have kind of got that figured out. Um, and I guess the, the sort of question I have is, are we too focused like politically here? Are we too focused on American exceptionalism when we analyze politics? And then in terms of the solutions and you lay out some of them with cooperatives and, and tax payments and antitrust. So you spend a paragraph or sorry, a chapter on the antitrust uh, subcommittee investigation and you know just sort of like asking questions of the CEOs. Um, are are the solutions uh, global as well? So are we when we when we look at Trump, or are we thinking this is a uniquely American phenomenon? Is that wrong? Or is this a is, is this a is this a global story? And then if it is a global story, are the solutions global, or are they you know national as well as global? That's a great question, uh, and there's a lot packed into that question. So this is a global problem. Uh, I mean, the U.S. is an outlier in terms of. Um, especially brutal conditions for workers, for people who are in harm's way and who require some government assistance. But, you know, the pandemic has revealed that this uh, obsession with uh, satisfying uh, the needs of the wealthiest and this faith, and it's become a cultural facet, you know, this is part of Davos Man's victory, is insinuating into our culture this assumption that, you know, if we look after, if we allow the biggest businesses more freedom, we set up conditions for the wealthiest people to prosper even more, somehow we'll all benefit, even though that in reality has happened to zero times. Uh, that is global. I mean, I tell the story, I could, I could tell multiple ones, but, you know, the one that comes to mind is, you know, look at Italy, uh, which was the first European country to really get hit hard by the pandemic. Well, the worst hit part of Italy was the state of Lombardy, which is the wealthiest, most advanced part of Italy. This is, you know, Milan, the financial center is in Lombardy. The most advanced forms of manufacturing are, are in Lombardy. Uh, and I tell the story of this woman, Chiara Lapora, who uh, is a doctor with um, uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders. Uh, and she's accustomed she, she's based in Dubai. She's used to spending her time in places like Sudan and Yemen, you know, dealing with the poorest people in, in conflict torn circumstances. And suddenly she's stuck in Italy because she's been visiting her parents. She can't get back to Dubai. And she and 50 other MSF doctors form a unit at a hospital in a very wealthy town in Lombardy, where she discovers that, first of all, this privatization scheme begun in the 80s has turned a public health system that was once built for, you know, epidemiology, family health, and it's turned it into, uh, it's dominated now by lucrative specialties. So, you know, if you have an exotic form of cancer or you need uh, a special cardiatric surgery, Lombardi's the place for you, but there's only five people in the entire city of Milan who know anything about epidemiology. There aren't enough family doctors. And the number of hospital rooms uh, ha has been reduced, you know, by like a third in the two decades leading up to the pandemic, which, by the way, is a very similar story in the U.S. So there's not enough capacity. There's not enough expertise. She discovers that there are all these private contracts at the hospital where she's working so that, you know, the company that's delivering uh, fresh bed linens or the company that's delivering meals, she's trying to get them to come less frequently to limit the spread of COVID-19 and she's told, well, that will be a breach of contract and, and she can't get them to do this. And no one's actually in charge of the system anymore because it's been basically parceled out to all these profit-making entities. I mean, I tell the story of 
privatization of uh, nursing homes in Sweden, which results in the worst of the pandemic, uh, to a, a de facto form of euthanasia, where elderly people, if you're in a nursing home and you end up with COVID symptoms in March or April, there's a good chance you, you're not even examined by a doctor. You're just put on a morphine drip and that's it. And I talked to uh, several doctors in, in the Stockholm area where this was happening who said, look, you know, we had reduced uh, our uh, capacity to treat people because we had reduced wealth taxes. They, we'd been concerned about people like Ingemar uh, Kamprad, the founder of IKEA, who had you know left Sweden to get out from under high taxes. So they reduced taxes on corporations, and I mean on Davos man basically, and they paid for that by uh, diminishing the social safety net, by diminishing uh, healthcare, and suddenly senior citizens are dying by the thousand in the first wave of the pandemic. Uh, without any treatment whatsoever, because the hospital system is being rationed and is protected uh, with the doctors understanding that they just don't have the capacity uh, to deal with the pandemic. So, you know, what we experienced in the States is part of that. I mean, I, we don't have time to get into it, but I tell the story of, you know, Blackstone, uh, the private equity company run by Steve Schwartzman, uh, buying into Team Health, this giant emergency room staffing company uh, that uh, is, you know, the sort of bleeding edge of private equity taking over American healthcare, so that American healthcare becomes, you know, more like your local Starbucks or or whatever airline you're on, you know, in the same way that your airline wants every seat full so that they can charge more for the seats. Uh, your local hospital, if it's got a profit making concern, uh, wants every hospital room full. So that's how the U.S. lost roughly a third of its hospital rooms in the two decades running up to the pandemic. And I, I tell the story of a, of a whistleblower at a, a, Black, uh, a hospital where Blackstone's company had deployed people who tries to put a stop to um, uh, elective surgeries uh, at a time when they have no triage system at this hospital in Bellingham, Washington. People aren't wearing masks. And he's told, oh, well, we don't want to freak out the the customers, you know, we don't want to freak out the people coming in for elective surgeries. That's the bread and butter. And the hospitals are our client. So if they don't like it, we're, we're, we're not going to do it. He goes public on Facebook as a whistleblower and he's fired, which underscores the moment, not just in the States again, but globally, where the societal interests in dealing with a pandemic are subsidiary to the profit making interests of the entities that increasingly have control of our healthcare system. That is very much a global story. And I think in terms of solutions, it's going to require a, a kind of global mobilization, though, of course, it will mostly happen at the local level, because most of, our, most of our services are still administered at the local level. But I do think it's important for us to understand that Davos man is global. And so our problems are global. Well, listen, we really appreciate you coming by. Um, so once again, uh, it's been uh, Peter, Peter Goodman presenting his book, uh, Davos Man, How the Billionaires Devour the World. And um, you can buy it at independent bookstores um, if you're a loser. Uh, or you can <laughs> uh, buy it at, at Amazon if you're a winner, um, is, is the point. Um, and uh, we're going to be doing this uh, we're going to be doing this uh, this series, Thinking Big, with authors over the next couple of months. The uh, the next uh, episode is going to be on July 21st, when we have uh, University of Michigan professor Elizabeth Pop Berman to discuss her recent book, Thinking Like an Economist, How Efficiency Replaced Equality in U.S. Public Policy. I've read it. It's really good. Um, and on August 16th, we'll feature Brandy Collins Dexter, who is a visiting fellow at Harvard Kennedy School, to talk about her upcoming book, Black Skinhead, Reflections on Blackness and Our Political Future. That is also good. Um, so thanks for joining us and thanks for bringing your questions. Um, and, and good luck, Peter. Um, your reporting is awesome and I look forward to your, your next book. Oh, well, thanks so much, Matt. Thanks, Morgan. Thanks to all of you. This was great. It was an honor to be the inaugural. Uh, and thanks for all the work that you guys are doing. It's, it's just tremendous and critical. Thanks, Peter. All right. Have a good night. Thanks, everybody, night, for joining. Everyone. Take care.